If you're ready to start your freelance career, this episode is for you. Welcome back to another episode of Design Today. I'm your host, Dylan Winspear. Today's episode is killer. For those of you who are trying to get into freelance design, my guest today has a ton of helpful information for you to apply. But before we get into it, a quick plug again for the Design Today offerings. Did you know I've got a Slack group and a newsletter and better yet, a free course to optimize your UX resume? It's 100% free. It will take you just a couple of hours to complete. Additionally, I've opened up a few more slots for the one-on-one coaching, which I know many of you are starting to take advantage of, and it's been incredibly fun. You can read some of those coaching reviews on the website if you visit designtoday.com slash courses. Now back to my guest, this man really needs no introduction. He's the author of one of my favorite business and design books called Burn Your Portfolio. He's the former creative director at Fox and the founder and former CEO of Riser, a digital agency. He's also got a handful of UX design courses, including his newest course called Freelance with Janda. Here he is, Michael Janda. Okay, we should be good. Mr. Michael Janda, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. We've been talking about this for months and finally it's happening. (laughs) I know. And I felt so bad for that. We initially started talking right before quarantine hit and I was kind of losing some of my mental health at that point in time and uh, Uh, (laughs) things really fell off the map for me. And I appreciate your kindness for still getting back to me and helping me get this together. It was good timing for me because when quarantine hit, That's when it was my catalyst to say, all right, no more messing around. I've got to get this course that I've been working on for a year. I've got to get it finished up and start filming it. So I went heads down into that during quarantine. I stopped posting on Instagram mostly after a year of posting probably five or six times a week. Mm -hmm. I started posting like once a week, maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, that quarantine was a good catalyst uh, of change. In a lot of things, not just in our businesses, but worldwide. I mean, it changed, yep. it changed the dynamic of the entire world. It's pretty crazy to live I've in oft, this time. I've often had to remind myself that, you know, I've been now working from home since March. And, you know, it, it presents different opportunities, unique opportunities that I hadn't had previously. And so I keep reminding myself, Dylan, it's hustle season. Like this is the, the yeah. opportunity that you have to make things happen that you've not had the opportunity to do in the past. So it's hustle season and you took advantage of that. Yeah, hustle season. Every every season is hustle season for me, but this one especially okay. this okay. one's especially <laughs> hustle season. <laughs> but I hear you, man. Yes, that is true. I just changed I changed my hustle. I I hustled so hard on Instagram for a year and then I was like, okay, I got to stop that hustle and hustle all my energy into this next. Well, uh, it's hard to hustle on multiple things at the same time. 100%. And being able to change gears and refocus is important. I, I do give you credit. You, you definitely hustle. You've done a lot of things for the design community. And I want to give you an opportunity to introduce some of those things that you've done, some of the things that you're working on. Ultimately, I do want to talk about uh, the course that you have just launched, but lead us up to that point. What brought you from where you began to today? All right. Well, that's that's a 20 year story, but I'll give you the two the two minute version. Tell me about your father and your mother. For, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. So I was born in 1972. <laughs> I'm just and, kidding. And we'll go from there. Uh, no, you know what? I grew up as the art kid. Uh, high school. I took all the art classes, collected comic books, drew comics and just loved that whole art thing. I went to college at Indiana University and decided to study design Mm -hmm. and uh, graduated and started in my bottom feeder jobs, man. After college, I couldn't get a job. I started working at Alpha Graphics was my first job out of college. And Alpha Graphics, for those of you who may be listening to this show, not in the United States, it's a copy copy store, you know, Xerox copiers in the in the lobby. It's that kind of thing. And I was like doing the cheap logos that they would do and cheap business cards for people who came in and didn't have they won't have any investment for their mm-hmm. business. And that was my start. And that was really a great catalyst to me to, to say, this is not what I want in my life. I thought that I had something to offer with this design degree. And, and then I had this rude awakening 
that I wasn't anywhere, that right. this was the start, not the finish. And I had, if I was going to achieve anything in my career, I was going to have to start working my butt off. And it was going to take a lot more than a college degree. And that was a real driver to me. I'm competitive, especially self-competitive. I want to one up myself from yesterday. I want to personal bests, you know, yep. is always an important thing for me. And uh, so that drove me and I, I worked hard. I self-educated. I learned design skills. I learned HTML and CSS and Flash and all the things back in those days that that allowed me to offer a broader uh, service offering. Mm -hmm. And then that launched into ending up. I was a creative director at Fox Studios in L.A., um, managed a big team of designers and, and developers, account managers. And that was a great experience. Then I started my agency while I was in Los Angeles. My first few clients were uh, my friends from Fox that started feeding me design work. They were at Disney and Sony and Warner Brothers, and they started sending me work. And uh, so my, my first, I mean, I started with the best clients in the whole world. Right. And then referrals and do good work and be good to work with and referrals will come and more projects will come. And that's what happened over 13 years of time as I grew my agency from me in my basement to a team of 20 people. I own a, I own the studio space. I still own it now. I sold my agency in 2015 and then I worked for the agency I sold to for a couple years. And pretty much I, I just did the whole agency thing for 15 years, 13 wow. on my own with my team. And then two years at the agency I sold to. Uh, and over the course of that time, I had the awakening that what do I really love in this industry. And it wasn't agency work. It wasn't even doing the work itself. What I really loved was the mentoring, coaching, building a team, helping inspire and motivate other people and help them progress. I love that. I got a lot of satisfaction out of that with my team. And that's what launched me into what I'm doing now. I love to create content and courses and write books and create Instagram posts and, and videos and be on podcasts like this because I just love educating, mentoring, supporting, yep. inspiring other creatives. Now, you've written a couple books. You've, you've got a couple courses. You do your own podcast. I was uh, sharing with you before we hit the record button that I initially became familiar with your name uh, when I discovered the book, Burn Your Portfolio. And, uh, -huh. uh, this has been an incredible resource to me, uh, an inspiration to me. I told you I was a little bit jealous when I first discovered it because you wrote a lot of things that one day I, I want to write, <laughs> but it is, I'm going to say inspiration at this point in time. It's an incredible book for designers who are trying to get a little bit more into personal development, career development, agency yeah. development. I mean, it's got a lot of great tidbits and advice in that book. Uh, was it your first book that you wrote? Yeah, that was my first book. It actually started as my employee handbook. When I started hiring people, I realized, oh man, these, I got to replicate myself mm -hmm. with these team members. I want them to do things the way that I do them because my clients expect it the way that I do it. That's why they hired my agency and why are they hired me? So if I'm going to have employees, they need to do the processes the same way I do. So the client has a seamless experience, whether they're working for me or working with one of my employees. So I started writing down every the way I do everything, just the systems and processes of how I did everything so that I could train my employees. And for five years, four years, four or five years, that uh, the content from Bring Your Portfolio was part of my employee training mm. website. It was a little website that I had, an uh, internal website. And then I spoke at a conference and, in Nashville and... It was a big AIGA conference. And after the conference where I spoke about the kinds of things that are in the book, the non-design things that you need to succeed as a designer, yep. I had a ton of great feedback. People asking for my deck. They wanted to turn my little chapter titles into posters for their office. I yep. had things like that. And I was like, oh, crap. I, can't, I just gave away my intellectual property and people want to make posters. I should be the one making posters of my own stuff, not somebody else who heard me say it. So 
I still have never made a poster on the content, <laughs> but it inspired me to say, I've got to get, I got to own my content. I can't just be going and speaking and sharing this stuff and not have copyright ownership of it. So I started turning all of that employee handbook into yeah. a book book Yep, and uh, ended up getting it published, which was an exciting moment in my life, 2013. Well, well, congratulations on that. You did not get a chance to make your posters, but you have released a couple of courses. Give me a 30 second recap of what your first course that you launched was. My first course is called UX with Janda and uxwithjanda.com. And that came out of um, some trips to Russia. I have, <laughs> my book, Burn Your Portfolio is, is in Russian language. And that opened up the door to go speak at a couple of events in Russia. During those events, I made good friends. I love to make friends everywhere I go. And I really connected with some of these people in the design community in Russia. And then they wanted to do some kind of collaboration with me. And one of them was a partner in what is now Russia's biggest on e-learning website for creatives. It's called Skillbox. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, um, you know, a Udemy for creative content, but it's all in Russian. And they had a UX course and they approached me and said, hey, well, let's do something. We have this UX course. We, why don't we make an English version of it and you teach it? And I thought, OK, great. That sounds great. And then they sent me the content and I was like, oh, man, I can't just do their content. <laughs> it's it wasn't as good as what I would have wanted to do for myself. So after trying to finagle their content into something that I would be proud of, I ended up just saying, you know what, let me just make my own course, UX course, and we'll still do this partnership. Um, and but it'll be my content and and we'll just have co-ownership on it. And that's what we did. I spent three weeks in Russia in early December in 2018 filming that course. And it hmm. was like straight out of the movies, man. I mean, the snow, slush everywhere, all the <laughs> Russians in their big coats and their heads down and their big Russian hats. I mean, that was what was everywhere. Uh, but it was a great, great, great experience to go and film that course. So that was my first course. Cool. Uh, and that's been out for about a little over a year now. And then I just finished my second course, which is Freelance with Janda, which is the business fundamentals that any freelancer needs to have. It's a six course suite and uh, just a ton of content. The first four courses I launched a month ago or, or about three weeks ago and just the first four core, uh, yeah, the first four courses is 26 hours of video content and tons of templates and it's a huge course. Yeah, it's huge. Uh, the the other two courses that I'm working on right now that'll launch in July will probably make the whole thing over 40 hours of content. Wow, it's just super turnkey. If you're a freelancer and you're a good designer but you don't know how to turn this into a business, that's what the course is. It's from how do you find your first clients all the way to how do you manage a business, hire people, fire people, everything in between. So it's not just for freelancers, although that's the title, but it's it could be called how to make a creative business. Mm -hmm. That's really what's at the heart of the course. Well, I'm going to drop a link for that kind of for your course in the show notes, but I hope you're OK starting Thank to you. talk a little bit of high level about that course, because ultimately that's you what bet. we're here to talk about. Uh, I ran a quick poll in the Design Today Slack community asking what topics people were interested in hearing about. And as I mentioned to you as we were talking you know, last week, um, because of COVID, the pandemic, there's a lot of designers that have been re recently laid off, uh, freelancers who are now struggling to freelance because people might be a little bit tighter yeah. with their money, uh, that from that poll results, people were interested in learning more about freelancing UX. Uh, and that's yeah. kind of when I made the connection of like, I really got to get back with Janda because I, I know he's just releasing this course. I, I followed the whole launch yeah. and I saw all that and I go, he's gonna be a great person to talk to. So again, because of this situation, we've got people who have not been freelancing UX before who now are. Yeah. And this is a new world yeah. to them. So where can you start to shed some light on these these first couple weeks and months of being a freelance UX designer? What What is top of mind for those people in that situation? You know, I think I'll start with a little bit of motivational 
perspective. Mm. Uh, I started my agency in a downturn economy. It was 2002. It was the post 9-11 and post dot bomb. The, the tech bubble had burst. All the dot com companies that weren't making money started to fold. The agencies that supported those businesses started to fold. I mean, we had big agencies that all their clients were dot com companies, big agencies in L.A. where I was living. And then all of a sudden, poof, they were out of business because all their clients were out of business. And so this was a it was a scary, scary time. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started freelancing because I, I was laid off from our team at Fox. They had we had sold Fox Kids and Fox Family. Those were our divisions, sold those to Disney and then Disney just went over a year and a half of time and dismantled our 50 person team down to the last six of us that were let go on the last day of of the Fox kids, uh, Fox family life. Mm -hmm. And it was super scary for me because I didn't have a crystal ball. I didn't know what was going to happen. I couldn't get a job because nobody was hiring just like now. I mean, it's hard if you don't have a job right now. It's scary because Hiring is slowed down because people are in this wait and see what happens with COVID-19 phase. Now, the flip side to that and what I learned is that business still goes on. Just because things slow down doesn't mean that people will never hire again. They change their strategies to meet the new world ahead. And the strategy change that happened in 2002 for me is that internal teams were no longer a thing. I'll give you an example. ABC.com, where one of my best buddies worked, mm -hmm. had a team of 50 people doing ABC.com. When I started freelancing for ABC.com, they had three people. It was a team of like three people. And it was the head of the, of the site and then like two account manager, project manager, people, marketing managers that were just executing on the stuff. They didn't have this team of 50 people, but they still needed to build the site. They still needed to get the work done. And instead of doing it internally, they started looking to outsource this stuff. Mm -hmm. So the bright future for freelancers right now is that you need to know that business is go going to keep going. People are going to still have new ideas. They're going to have a new app idea that emerges out of their fear mm -hmm. that makes them think harder and makes them ideate what they're going to do for their business. And then that will perpetuate opportunities for freelancers because all these new ideas that come out of the fear that we're in now will need to be executed by somebody. And when people don't have internal teams and other agencies and, and businesses are struggling, they start to look around who's going to do this for me. Mm -hmm. So I think from my perspective, there is a huge opportunity for freelancers in the next one to five years that we're seeing a change in the way that does the design economy is done. There's a huge opportunity for people to grow and build design businesses out of this downturn. Yep. So, so I've, go ahead. Nope. I was just going to say, so that's, that's where I wanted to start on just a, a perspective shift, hopefully to help people feel like, okay, I get it. There yes. are, there are opportunities here that are going to come out of this. It's not just going to be me scared about how I'm going to pay my bills for the rest of my life. It's not going to be that. When I like how you said business goes on, obviously that's, it's important to remember. And I think, again, these these changes in climate help us experience just new ideas and new, and new changes, it puts us into new roles that we may not have been previously comfortable with. And so out of that comes new ideas that people want to start working yeah. on. Um, I free What's like, the quote? It's like something like something is the mother of invention. What's the what's the thing that's the mother of invention? The I know what you're talking about, too, and I can't remember. Absence or something. Anyway, while you're talking, I'm going to look up the, this quote because I know I've I've uh, it's on your mind. So you got to feel it now. The mother of invention quote. And this is what we're living right now. It, necessity. necessity. Necessity is the mother of invention. And so many people are in that right now. They're 
they're in this fear mode. Yep. Oh my gosh, how am I going to feed my family? I just got let go of my from my job. I had this happen. Somebody bought my course a couple of days ago and they messaged me and they said, I'm so excited. I just found out I was getting let go from my bit, my job two days ago. And now I decided it's time for yep. me to jump into freelance. I've got to make this work. And I'm so excited about your course because it's the the approach, the turnkey approach that I need. Necessity. There is no job anymore. This person has a need to pay the bills, to put food on the table, to cover their personal overhead. That necessity is going to drive them to invent. Mother, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. You're going to see so much of that come out of this downturn. It's going to be pretty amazing. You watch the next couple years, the things that are invented because people finally have time to think yep. because of this downturn. Yep. And then they have the necessity, which causes fear, to make them act. Yep. Uh, it's, it's an exciting future ahead as a result of this. I agree. So I have freelanced part-time uh, for the better part of the last eight, nine years. And I've always been a little bit too nervous to make it the full-time thing. And the reason why is I've mm. been able to narrow it down to finding, pricing, and repeating. That's always been mm -hmm. my, my biggest fears is that I know I can do UX and I know I can do a good job once I get into the project, but I was always scared yeah. of the sales part of freelancing, yeah. finding pricing yeah. and repeating that over and over and over again. What advice yeah. do you have for designers who are gonna start to face that? I know I can find my first client, but finding the second one is now difficult. And how do I repeat yeah. these results? Well, okay. So the the first client, I'll, let me let me break this down in a nutshell, actionable thing for people. Your first client is probably somebody who you already know right now, who likes you, who trusts you, who's working at some company, and they are willing to share your name with whoever the decision maker is to outsource work to you. That's who your first customer most likely is. It's not somebody who's gonna find you on Dribble or Instagram and just drop out of the sky and say, you're the one for me. That is hardly likely. Likely is that it's somebody you know right now. So step number one is talk to everybody who you freaking know and tell them that you're a freelancer doing UX design and you're trying to build your client base. And if they don't know what UX design is, then don't phrase it that way. Say, hey, I'm a freelancer. I design apps and websites and I'm looking to build my client base. And then let that, let all this, this batch of people you know start to be your sales force. You just have to make sure that you tell them what the heck you're doing. And so many freelancers just stink at this. They, they're just in their basement, just cranking away behind their computer, hoping that clients drop from the sky. And that is not going to happen. You got to tell at least the people closest to you what you're doing. And man, start with your mom. Your mm -hmm. mom will be the greatest salesman you ever had <laughs> she, for, for your first client. She'll be at the hair salon and she'll be talking to the the hair person, you know, I'm, I don't know much about hair, so I, cause I'm bald, but the, the hair person, she'll be talking to the hair person and she'll, uh, tell them, Hey, my son or my daughter designs websites. And you, do you have a website? It's the people closest to you. That's where you're going to probably find your first client. So start there. Now, how do you get them to repeat and grow? It, it is you know, you see the cliche quote, be good to work with, do good work, be good to work with. Uh, it's cliche, but I built my entire business on this mindset. And it's a slow growth model because one client that you start with, the hair salon that your mom goes to is your first client. You design their website and then you design something else for them later that year. This one client cannot sustain your business. This is where a lot of part-time freelancers exist. They have this one, two client thing. They work a full-time job. They have a couple side clients. But all of a sudden in year two, they get client number two. And then in year three, client the two clients, if they make them happy and they are good to work with, 
those two clients turn into four more clients. And then in year four, those four clients turn into 16 clients. There's this, this uh, compound interest style thing. It's exponential returns. And it happens with client lists. Mm-hmm. It takes you as long. It happens in social media. It happens with podcasts. You, you know, to, for you to go from your very first podcast to your first 1,000 listener month took a year. I don't know how long it took you, probably faster than that, but let's say that took a year. But to go from 1,000 listeners to 10,000 listeners was a year. That's exponential growth. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens with clients too. You have to start with this one or two. You gotta bend bend, bend over backwards to make those people happy, deliver great results, build a strong relationship, and then those people become your referral chain for new opportunities. And this is the way it is in the early phases of freelancing. It's relationship-based, very heavy relationship-based like this, referrals and repeating customers. But over time, you get to hit the, the moment when your reputation precedes you. And now people have heard about your business. They've heard about you as a great UX designer inside of some certain industry, you've built enough of a name for yourself that people start to come to you because of reputation. Uh, The big agencies do this uh, on on a big scale. When you think of uh, one of the agencies that's built a a, a reputation over the last few years is Red Antler. They're based in Brooklyn. And I started hearing about Red Antler about a year ago And then all of a sudden I start seeing them pop up on ad age agency of the year. You know, they're one of the like the small agencies to watch or something. They they start popping up on things and then all of a sudden they start to build a reputation. They build a reputation in my mind and in the mind of a lot of other designers around. And now here I am on your podcast talking about (laughs) Red Antler and I've never met anybody at Red, Red Antler ever in my life but I'm talking about them because they have a reputation. When you hit that threshold, that's when projects just start dropping out of the sky to find you. Yep. You don't have to chase them down as much, but in the early years, where you are today as a freelancer who just started this week, it's the people you know yep. that are going to be your first batch of clients, and then it's the people that they know that are going to be your second batch of clients. And then over a few years, you'll start to get that reputation referral happening where people have heard of you, like we all have now, of Red Antler. Yep. And I like that process. I like that timeline that you're laying out there as well. Let me ask you, when when you started to attract your first dozen clients, what type of public resources do you need to make available so to start attracting new clients? What do people need to put together? So... I'm a big believer in you need a website and it needs to be a custom URL. It should not be squarespace.com slash Dylan. That's not going to do you justice. Make it Dylan.com. So start, start there. You've got to have a website and with a custom URL because that says to the window shoppers of the world, that you're actually serious about this business, that you're, you're putting real effort behind it. You're willing to spend the $9 a month to host a website somewhere. Mm -hmm. And you're willing to spend at least the $15 a year to re-register your custom domain. Mm -hmm. So start there. That's, you've got to have that as the bottom and then pick one social media and go all in on that social media. And for designers, the best choices are either Instagram or Dribbble or Behance. Pick one of those social media channels and start sharing your work. Get your work out there so that people can see it. So you can start building that reputation. And even if it's only a handful of followers, let's say a handful to you know, if I say a thousand followers or 5,000 followers, that sounds like a lot to a lot of people, but it's feasible for anybody to build an audience of 5,000 followers on Instagram. If you share content and 
interact with your community, you'll grow on Instagram. So you have this 5,000 follower base on the one channel you chose. Now that is validation Mm -hmm. to anybody shopping you. If they look at your website and they see your work and then they think, okay, who is this person? And they go to Instagram because you promote it on your site and force them there. They see that you have 5,000 followers. It's a legitimizer. So for, for your first social media, pick something and build an audience there so that you can have it legitimize your position in the market in the eyes of your customer. Do you have any insight on what point a freelancer should start considering developing through their LLC as opposed to independent contractor? Um, as soon as you've decided that this is long term, that, that I'm going to freelance, then you can start either an LLC and have, have it be a partnership LLC with you and your spouse, or you can do a sole owner LLC, which I have for one of my businesses. I have a lot of little business entities inside of my, what I do in my mm-hmm. life right now. And um, one of them, I have a sole owner LLC, a single owner LLC, I think is what it's called. Um, and then you can also just operate as a sole proprietor. And, and until you start hiring people, there's really not a downside to being a sole proprietor. Uh, but there, an LLC does give you some risk protection yep. uh, of your personal assets. So m- my recommendation in long-winded, after the long-winded explanation is if you've decided, okay, I'm going to be doing this. I, I'm going to be, I'm going to be really going after this and I'm going to be freelancing and I'm going to do this for the next few years. Once you feel like that, then there's no reason to not spin up at least a single member LLC. Yeah. As I mentioned to you, when I started doing freelance UX work, it started really small and you're talking about year over year started to grow. And I remember one mm-hmm. of those years is probably 2013 or 2014. I made a, a decent amount of passive income freelancing and yeah. then tax season came around and I just remember getting raked over the coals. And I thought yeah. to myself, like, I'm done. Like, I I didn't make any money freelancing. I just paid yeah. all the back in taxes. And yeah. uh, I was so just kind of blown away by it. I finally talked to a CPA and set up an LLC. And it was definitely worth it. But I agree with you. You're saying once you've really committed yourself to this is what you want to do. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to commit yourself full time. It just means that you are going to be doing right. this consistently. Yeah. I think it, it begins to make sense. Another yeah, question it makes that, sense. Another question that people yep. have often is pricing. I don't know how to yes. begin pricing myself. You know, my first yeah. logo I designed was $100. Is that right or wrong? Yeah. And people don't know what to do. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I know that this is such a huge problem. And I, I wrote another book called The Psychology of Graphic Design Pricing, which is a 200-page symposium on my pricing methodology. And I'll give you the distilled breakdown of this. And there's a chapter in Burn Your Portfolio, which you mentioned at the start, that is called the Fixed Bid Pricing Dartboard. And it's like a page and a half little chapter. And I thought, well, this was two summers ago. I thought, okay, you know, I'll just, I'll make a, an expanded blog post version mm-hmm. of that chapter. Mm-hmm. And I started trying to expound on this idea of the fixed bid pricing dartboard and it ended up becoming a 200 page book instead of a, you know, five page blog post. Mm-hmm. Cause once I started to pull the thread, there was so much to say. So let me give you the breakdown of this, of my pricing methodology. My pricing methodology is based on three different variables that you need to understand when you go in to price a project. Variable number one is how much is this project going to cost you to produce? Production cost, variable number one. And you can figure out your production cost. Let's say that Dylan charges $100 an hour and he's talking with a client and he estimates in his head that this is going to take him 10 hours to produce this work. So he right there knows that $1,000 is his production cost for this. Now that's not the price that he charges the client. That's only one variable that leads him to the price that he will choose. So production cost, that's variable number one. 
Variable number two is the market value of the work. Now, Dylan looks at this and he says, okay, this is going to take me $1,000 of production cost, but what would other people like me charge for this? If they're going to design the interface for a new app, app, how much are people charging for the 10 screens that need to be designed for the UX of this application? And you got to understand that market value number. What are other people like you charging? How do you find that number? Well, start asking your friends what they charge for this same kind of stuff. If you're a UX designer, you, you usually have other UX designer friends. Say to them, hey, how much are you charging these days for app design? Say you've got a 10 screen app. What do you usually charge your client? So you start asking that. You can also get information from things like the Graphic Artist Guild Handbook that comes out every few years with surveys of a variety of different types of projects and where agencies and freelancers have surveyed in their responses and it breaks them down Mm -hmm. into tables for you to see what the market value is of these different types of projects that you do. So that's variable number two, market value. Production cost, market value, variable number three is the client's budget. How much is the client willing to spend on this project? You got to know that because budget is a, a variable that is subjective from one client to the next. To one person, $1,000 is a lot of money. To another person, it is nothing but it's still a thousand dollars. It's just the perception of the value of a thousand dollars. And you're going to find with your clients a wide variety of perception of what the value of a thousand dollars is. So you have to ask the client their budget thresholds and start talking about the numbers, the dollars of this engagement right out of the, the first lead qualification phone call that you have. So you ask the client things like, okay, well, you ask them a whole bunch of questions about their project, you get all the details, and then you say, okay, one final question, how much are you hoping to do this for? What budget do you have allocated to execute on this work? And a lot of clients will tell you, and some will make it play hard to get, and I won't go through all the ways to extract the budget, but I have several videos on that that are posted on my Instagram and my YouTube channel on how to extract the client's budget, but you gotta know that variable. So now you take this and you say, okay, Dylan knows that $1,000 is his production cost. He asked his designer friends and knows that everybody's charging roughly two to three grand for this type of work. That's the market value. And then he asked the client their budget and the client said, well, we're really hoping to get this done for $1,800. Now Dylan can take these three variables and say, okay, market value, let's say is 3000. The client's budget is 1800 and my production cost is 1000. That gives me my range, $1,000 to $3,000 and the client's budget is 1800. Now, if I'm super busy and I can't really fit anything else in, then I'm probably going to say, okay, well, you know what? I'll do this project for two grand. I know the client's going to have to up their budget by 200 bucks, but I don't care if they go away. Mm -hmm. I don't care because I'm super busy. I'm going to have to work all weekend to do this if they say yes. So I better make it worth my while. But other times you might be like, I have no projects. I have no leads. I have not done a project in the last three months. I got to land this. So in that situation, you can say, okay, well, my production cost is $1,000. Now I'm going to bid this at 1400 because I'm going to come in under budget. That way, if anybody else, the client has having bid on this comes in below their budget, I'm far enough below their budget that I'm going to be the price friendly option and increase the likelihood of me landing the work. So where you choose to price it, depends on the situation you're in. And I have a whole bunch of different situations and scenarios that are in that book. But the point is, is you, it's not, the, there's no cookie cutter method that lets you know this is exactly where I'm going to price it. It's different every time, but you always will benefit from knowing those three pricing variables. 
Yeah, I, and I love that. You've obviously been doing this for quite some time because that's a great way of breaking it down. And I love seeing how UX designers evolve those numbers as they as they develop in their skill set in their career. You know, their first logo may have mm-hmm. been a hundred dollars, and a couple of years later, it may have been a thousand dollars, and a couple of years later, it may be a five grand full branding package exactly. that advances their services that they're offering. So be comfortable with evolving it as you're going on. I think that's great advice. I, I did. I, my first logo was $200 or something like that. And, um, and I did a website. This is what, like, right after I graduated college, I did a website and it was like 300 bucks or something that I charged this person to hand code and design this big website for him. And at my agency, 15 years later, we were doing $500,000 mm-hmm. websites. So mm-hmm. Just because you're starting in these lower price points does not mean you will always be there. You can up your prices over time, evolve your pricing strategy, increase your reputation, and then clients will naturally pay you more money because you have because they want you yep. to do this work. Yep. I think there's some people that get a little bit fearful of like, well, if another designer, I heard I did a logo for hundred dollars, they're going to think less of me. And, you know, we can go into like, stop comparing yourself to other designers. Yeah. You know, your situation better than anybody yes. else does. I remember when I yep. was, uh, this was four or five years back. It was a great learning experience for me. I typically was doing these websites for, you know, 2000, $2,500. Uh, and they would be simple seven page websites, you know, about to contact a services type, type yeah. website. And um, I got this one opportunity to work for this client who I was going like, I actually don't want to work with him. And I, you know, th- I don't think it's gonna be worth my time. Even if I did get this, I, he's just not a person I want to work with. And so I literally, yes. I doubled my, but what my proposal was uh-huh. and I charged him five grand as a, this is, yeah. this is what the cost would be. They ended up coming back and saying like, great, we'll do it. And I was like, wait, yeah. what? Yeah. Like, Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it like changed my, I was like, well, if you're willing to do it for five grand, you know what? I'll make this work for us then. Right. And so it yes, really was exactly. able to change the thoughts that I put into it. And it worked out for the better. It was actually a, a really fun website for me to end up working on. It ended up turning out fantastic. And uh, it was a win-win for all of us. And it was such a yeah. great learning experience for me. But again, I'll go back to, you know, your situation better than anybody else. And you've got to develop yeah. that, that mindset. And it's a great, it's a great story and a great example. Um, and it's one of the scenarios that I talk about a difficult client, I would always charge them at the top of market value or even higher. Mm-hmm. If they're, you know, your, your price is in is relative to the pain that this client can potentially <laughs> cause you. And if somebody's going to be massive pain in the butt, then don't be afraid to jack the price way up to make it worth your while to go through that pain. Yep. Uh, so that's a great story and a great example that that you just shared. And I love that. It's, uh, um, you know, that, that variable, I did it a lot. It mm-hmm. was, and then I got burned on when I didn't do it. I got burned on sure. when somebody had the red flags were there and I charged them too low. And then it, it, it caused me grief. I lost employees over in client over clients. Ugh. And so now, now the cost is excessive because of the pain and my need to restaff positions because this client inflicted so much pain on, on me. Oh man, it's miserable. Good learning. Experiences, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Good learning experience. I think what I wanted to say about this is, and you've said it like two or three times, Dylan, but it's know your situation and don't feel bad about where you price your stuff. Yep. If, but know your production costs. This is why we calculate that one variable. Don't go below it. Cause then that's a stupid business. That's right. you, you're not making any money. Don't do that. So calculate yep. that variable first and then always bid above it, but don't feel bad if it's only a 10% or 20% profit margin. It's going to cost you $1,000 to do this. You're going to make $1,200 on the job and you're going to have $200 of profit. Man, it's, uh, in certain points of your life, that is just fine. Yep. Don't ever feel bad about it. You can always start increasing your prices over time and you will. If you do good work, and you are good to work with, to go to back to the cliche, your prices will increase. Well, Jen, I've unfortunately got to call it at time here. Um, it's crazy Sad. how fast this went. I feel like we were just getting started. <laughs> I know. And there's going to be people listening to us going like, wait, what? No, don't. 
Um, <laughs> unfortunately, you've not printed any posters yourself, but I've got a few good pull quotes that I could turn into posters. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of nuggets and gems in this podcast. I really appreciate all the thought and the time that you're taking to answer some of these questions. Um, I'm going to drop some links in the show notes for all the different places that people can find you, including your Instagram, your website, your books. I mean, there's so Thank many you. good resources there. I, I'll encourage people to reach out and find you. Um, Thank you for your time. If there's an opportunity in the future, I'd love to do this with you again. Maybe do a part two to this. Yeah, man. I feel like we just did the introduction. So we really did. yeah, let's let's hit one in the fall after uh, you get through some of your upcoming ones, and and let's do it again for sure. You know, and, and I'll even throw this out to those who are listening. Uh, leave a comment wherever you're finding this. Let me know. Join the Slack community and leave a comment. What questions do you have from this that we can even go back and touch on again in the future and then we can elaborate and go further on it. So that's that's just a plug for everyone who's listening. Michael, thank you for your time. Oh man, thank you. So fun. I'm sad it's over. I know. too fast. I know. I told you only an hour (laughs) of your time and we're hitting it right now. So (laughs) thank you very much. We'll have to do this again. Um, That's been another episode of Design Today. Thanks everyone for listening.